So we're good. We're good. I'm gonna just mute myself and turn it over to you, Liz. Okay. So welcome everyone. Very nice to see or uh, see the numbers of you who are here. Thank you for coming. So I'd first like to begin this afternoon by paying respect to and thanking the Haudenosaunee Confederacy on whose land Syracuse University and where I live occupy. There is still much we need to do to learn from their ability to live peace peacefully together amongst the differences of tribal identities, geographies, and customs. I ask that we each consider our own place in the history and story of colonization and of undoing its legacy. So this series, the DEI student lecture series is created for and by our students and provides opportunities to engage with activists, educators, practitioners, and scholars to discuss topics affiliated with the student committee's ambition to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive academic and professional environments. Generously supported by the Dean's Office, this student-led initiative invites speakers to present their work and foster broader discussions among students and faculty. I am quite excited to introduce Juliet Spertus, who is our speaker this afternoon. I had the great pleasure of first meeting Juliet at the Beyond Patronage Symposium at the University at Buffalo in 2012. It was there where she presented From Fast Trash to New York City Tubes. And I was quite taken with this project and the work that she'd been doing, where she and her collaborative team sought alternative approaches for waste in New York. Beginning with an exhibi exhibition in a community run art space that as she describes is part infrastructure portrait, part urban history and site, site specific installation. The project creatively highlighted various approaches of bringing information to the public from walking towards a symposium and an online exhibition to a video on invisible garbage. The use of cultural programming as a way to educate Excuse me, I just, I'm not sure what happened. Um, the use of cultural programming as a way to educate the public about these serious issues enabled not only the raising of public awareness around waste, but also led to engaging city officials. In 2014, she co-founded Closed Loops with Benjamin Miller, where they lead a series of research projects on the future of waste in New York City. As their website states, we aspire to build livable cities by making the design of overlooked support systems as an integral part of the planning process. They formed closed loops to help communities meet ambitious environmental targets by optimizing the truck, rail, marine, and pipeline connections that bring goods and remove waste and augmenting these systems with complementary technologies. I look, I'm very much looking forward to, her, to Juliet's talk um, and the work that she's been involved in over many years. And I want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Juliet. Uh, well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to now share my screen. And uh, let's see. Um, I just one moment. Um, Being both together, so I think. Hold on one sec. Um, We'll try it this way. Um, let's see if I can share this, if I'm able to. Okay, do you see the, great. All right. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Lori, for that introduction. Um, Trash uh, is everywhere, and it's clogging up streets and draining municipal budgets. Um, but the solutions are really hard to find. I'm going to talk about um, several projects that I've worked on over the last decade and my journey 
as a designer and a researcher, seeking solutions by making systems visible, identifying efficiencies, by making tools, and importantly, changing perceptions about how we manage materials from something to hide into an amenity, even something to celebrate. This is an image from the Zero Waste Design Guidelines that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we're going to have to, uh, in order to do this, we have to break down the barrier between planning and design and operations and maintenance. We have to learn from the people who are on the ground. Um, and if we can collectively solve for waste, we will improve quality of life for everybody, especially the people with the least agency the least control over their environment and their work. Uh, so the volume of waste uh, in New York City is staggering. Um, New York City throws out about 24,000 tons of waste every day. That's um, 2,000 of these white garbage trucks full. Um, about half of that material is coming from residents and institutions, and it's collected by the sanitation department, which is a municipal agency. And the other half is collected from, uh, of, uh, is business waste collected by private haulers. Um, so we have two parallel systems in New York City. Um, that material is taken to transfer stations um, like this one in Staten Island, um, where trash is loaded onto rail cars uh, and heads to South Carolina, to a landfill. Um, meanwhile, in New York City, buildings and neighborhoods are not designed to manage this volume. The city spends $1.5 billion a year on collection, but a regular pickup day can still look like a bar garbage strike. Even though piles of trash attract rats and make the sidewalks impassable. Most buildings do not have um, the room to store containers and trucks in New York City are still loaded by hand, bag by bag. Um, and that has to do with the legacy of New York City's uh, grid and the way that it was designed. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, sanitation work is one of the most dangerous jobs above that of firefighting and policing. Garbage trucks kill more pedestrians than cabs do, and they're the top, one of the top noise complaints at night, and one of the major delays of school buses and traffic during the day. Handling waste is also one of the greatest sources of occupational injury for building maintenance staff. Meanwhile, the demands on the curb are only increasing. And right now with COVID, those impacts are even more acute now that restaurants um, and other um, activity has to happen outside, not to mention bicycling and um, all the other things that happen in a city. Um, waste really conflicts with our ability to uh, change, change how we live. Um, so as a designer, you could ask yourself, how can this be? Why, why are we in this situation? Um, in 1969, the Urban Development Corporation um, uh, announced their plans for Roosevelt Island. UDC was a New York State entity that was formed in 1968, right after the death of Martin Luther King to create housing and address the failures of previous urban renewal efforts. So with Roosevelt Island, the UDC hoped it could demonstrate that with design and innovation and social engineering, it was possible to improve conditions for people of all income levels and to keep the middle class from fleeing to the suburbs and start a vicious, a virtuous cycle of investment in urban communities. A key feature of this high profile plan was that there would be no cars. Um, so uh, in keeping with the pedestrian orientation, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. In keeping with the pedestrian orientation, engineers installed a pneumatic collection system 
to collect trash without the garbage trucks or the piles of trash on the sidewalks. Uh, and this is a brochure um, that was given to prospective residents about this amenity um, that would be provided on Roosevelt Island. Um, this is the postcard from the exhibit. You know, um, I was thinking about those trash bags when I organized uh, Fast Trash. Um, and I asked, you know, the question, as Lori mentioned in her introduction, you know, what solutions might there be for our time uh, in the history of this development and its alternative waste collection? The first task was literally making this underground system visible uh, for Roosevelt Island residents, most of whom had no idea it was there. Um, so we worked with the Center for Urban Pedagogy and children on the island to interpret the system and to describe how it worked, how the waste got from buildings to uh, the central collection station underground. We even created a, a user guide um, so that uh, people could understand and appreciate this infrastructure that they had. Um, the exhibit uh, space had a, also installed a pneumatic tube, uh, a small one, so that people could bring their kids and sort of have fun thinking about the movement of material. Um, we also uh, mapped the tubes that were running under the streets and under the buildings uh, onto the floor of the gallery and we commissioned portraits of the staff, the sanitation staff that worked uh, to operate the system. The second piece of this was to make the system visible as a potential solution for planners and for professionals. And we did this with comparisons to systems in other cities at a similar scale um, so that uh, we could start to separate from the quirky history of Roosevelt Island and look at this more modern pneumatic systems. Um, we organized a symposium uh, with the owners and operators of these systems um, in conversation with New York City officials and hosted at New York University's um, policy school. So I came away from all of this convinced that Roosevelt Island system had many confelling features. It was a modular solution that shifted the burden of storing and managing waste away from individual buildings, avoiding all the nuisances and changing the nature of maintenance work. While bulky waste like furniture and large cardboard will always uh, have to be managed manually, newer systems incorporate multiple recycling streams by pulsing them through the tube at different times. The Center for Urban Pedagogy invited Ben Miller, who is the former director of policy planning at the sanitation department, to speak um, at Fast Trash. Um, in his talk, he mentioned the potential that he saw for pneumatic collection to address the congestion and other difficult to solve impacts um, of truck uh, movement in a dense urban environment. We began working together to evaluate the costs and benefits of pneumatic collection compared to trucks, first by modeling the impacts on Roosevelt Island if the system were not there, and then comparing that to different upgrades to the system. Diesel emissions from truck traffic are linked to increased rates of asthma and most of the truck-based transfer stations and many garages are located in a few neighborhoods in the Bronx and Brooklyn. You can see on the map on the left, those red dots are where the truck-based transfer stations are. And on the right is a map uh, showing the commercial truck traffic operations in the city and the intensity of those truck trips going around picking up trash mostly at night from restaurants and businesses. Um, let's see. Uh, we worked first uh, through CUNY's University Transportation Research Center, where Ben was a senior research fellow in the freight programs, and later formed uh, closed loops so that we could 
um, do a sort of non-academic work and not only, not only academic work, but start to um, catalyze the implementation of these projects and um, work with other um, stakeholders. Uh, we then went on to model how pneumatic systems could be incorporated into uh, dense existing neighborhoods using uh, transportation infrastructure like subway tunnels and viaducts. This example shows um, a map uh, that we uh, looked at of a pneumatic system under the Second Avenue subway or in the Se Second Avenue subway tunnel um, and then leveraging that to collect waste from neighbors like these NYCHA washing, Washington houses and the hospital, just giving a sense of what is possible with these um, neighborhood or district scale consolidation of waste with pneumatic tubes. Um, uh, we looked at how many truck miles could be saved and the impacts of shifting from diesel to electricity. Um, and um, in addition to Roosevelt Island and the Second Avenue subway, we also looked at the High Line Viaduct. Um, before it was a famous park, the High Line uh, was an urban freight rail line that was actually built to reduce the impacts of freight coming in and out of factories in, in the Chelsea neighborhood. Um, so we felt a real kinship uh, pneumatic tubes in a way is doing the same thing, trying to reduce the impacts um, for, for in, on public space and make the flow of material more efficient. Um, we wondered if we could hang a pneumatic tube under the High Line, uh, we could then use this uh, infrastructure um, that is now a park, uh, and give it a new transportation uh, use. Um, we could not only avoid the truck miles from the trash, but we could uh, move waste and recycling and organics um, directly to processing facilities um, by using the city's existing freight rail network. So this map is showing uh, the High Line tube in its little neighborhood, and then um, in the yellow is the Empire Line which has not been used for freight and since the High Line was um, decommissioned, but is still used for Amtrak. Um, and then the black line is the uh, rail route to get to trash, um, this, you know, landfill and also um, incinerators. The brown is showing the route that you can take to get to the city's organics pre-processing facility and the blue is the freight is the rail line that connects to the city's uh, recycling uh, plant. Normally railroads require intermodal facilities to take material and load it onto rail. But with pneumatic collection, the containers are automatically filled and the facility does not require truck access. Um, so it could actually be located very easily underground uh, in space that is not used for anything else. In this case, under at grade, under an elevated portion of 11th Avenue. Reconnecting to freight rail would require some adaptation and finding additional users to justify new train service. But this is very much in line with the New York City Department of Transportation's vision for making urban freight more sustainable and taking uh, and shifting away from truck traffic. After our academic reports and papers were published, we concluded that while we had shown real benefits, the potential system owners that we were talking to were unwilling to consider the significant capital investment and, administ and, and even more the administrative hurdles um, especially considering that the greatest benefits are public. NYSERDA encouraged us to continue. Uh, NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research Development Authority that had funded uh, several rounds of our research. Um, and they are um, an entity that takes funds from electricity consumers and um, directs it to research uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, 
and pneumatic collection is an electric, essentially an electric vehicle um, and an innovative uh, technology. So they were very interested in and finding an application. Um, so they gave us additional funding to continue uh, uh, a pre-implementation study. And we began working with a community-led model in collaboration with property owners and businesses um, and the Business Improvement District. The Mayor's Office of Sustainability led a steering committee of city agencies overseeing the various jurisdictions, parks, Department of Transportation, Department of Buildings, Department of Sanitation, and others to help us manage access to the easement under the High Line Viaduct and leasing space under the right of way, etc. Um, as we worked with our stakeholders, the project evolved. Um, it became a district scale utility with three main components. Uh, the first one is the pneumatic tube collecting waste from properties along the High Line. Um, the second is the tube to a rail transfer terminal that I showed you. And then the third piece is a micro anaerobic digestion um, facility to take 5,000 pounds of, of um, food waste from restaurant kitchens. This is material that we didn't really want to send out of the city um, for processing because it's very controlled and it could be, um, it's very easy to process in, uh, on site into compost or in this case into biogas. Um, initially, we had been looking only at connecting, uh, well, most pneumatic systems uh, use uh, trash chutes or we were looking at connecting loading docks of large office buildings like the Chelsea Market, uh, which is now owned by Google and other big uh, properties. Uh, but we realized um, that if we could create hubs for the community to use, um, the system could have a much larger a swath of, the, of Chelsea, because basically we would be um, creating a kind of um, public transit of trash. So instead of connecting individual apartment buildings and being dependent and limited by the investments that individual buildings were, were being were prepared to make, that we could actually um, create these uh, public, publicly accessible um, hubs, we were calling them. And because uh, they were connected to the pneumatic tube network, they never need to be collected by truck, so they don't need a curb cut. And businesses and uh, buildings of any size could come and bring their material, drop it off and uh, be on their way, sort of 24 seven access. Um, uh, so this was very exciting and it also meant, so not only could we expand the size of the system um, and capture a much larger area, but we could also start to imagine this as a model that could be used in other parts of the city because we're not dependent on a building type um, and I mentioned the anaerobic digestion uh, food waste. So um, we proposed a shared uh, microanaerobic digester on the roof of the Gansevoort Meatpacking Co-op, which is a city-owned building, the last vestige of the meatpacking industry in that area. Um, it would be visible from the Whitney and the High Line and it could take fat and bone from the meat packers and food waste from commercial kitchens and all the restaurants nearby um, and convert that into a biogas, which we could then uh, convert into electricity and actually power, we found, um, the central refrigeration plant of the Gansevoort market. Um, so we thought this could be a uh, catalyze a whole series of these micro anaerobic digesters to br keep uh, food waste uh, in, in the neighborhood and, and generate energy. Um, so as the scale of the system increased, the public benefits also increased. Um, in exchange for the public benefits, the city would agree to lease land under 11th Avenue for the rail accessible pneumatic terminal. Uh, to an entity that would, an operating entity. 
The city would also allow access to the Highline viaduct easement. Um, pr private stakeholders were prepared to fund an engineering study that would be necessary um, for the cost benefit analysis um, that would be needed as long as the city was willing to grant access. The capital expenditures for the infrastructure would be funded against the operating fees that these um, property owners were willing to contribute. Um, so it now seemed as if, because they, one point is that they, um, unlike residential waste, which is collected uh, based on, on taxes, there are no, residents are not charged for what they uh, put on the curb. Businesses are charged for the amount of waste they generate. Uh, and so we could use that to fund this system in a way that is more difficult with the residential only system. Uh, so we now felt like we had a model that addressed the issue of funding and the admi administrative hurdles. Um, in 2019, the project received support from the community board, uh, board from elected officials, the, the Manhattan Borough President, uh, the city council members, the uh, congressman, the state, state and, um, and at the federal level. They, joined, they signed a joint letter requesting that the city grant access to, so the study could proceed. That letter went to the mayor's office and we are still waiting. Um, so, um, you know, the goal of that project was to catalyze the construction of one high profile system that would be a model for future projects in other neighborhoods without the type of wealthy property owners uh, and, you know, the profile of the High Line area. Neighborhoods like Sunnyside and Queens, where we worked with the MTA on a concept to pilot a pneumatic collection under the Seven Line viaduct, in this case, to um, collect waste from subway platforms. Um, our focus was on improving the circulation of material through cities. Um, and the concept for distributed waste transport was referenced in the mayor's office 80 by 50 plan and in the Department of Transportation urban freight report. But without the political will at the highest level, we were unable to build that first system. Um, then we met Claire Mifflin. Claire uh, is an architect who had just uh, designed a LEED certified building with chutes for recycling and trash. And she asked the question, you know, how should I design a residential building so that residents can participate in the city's uh, recent uh, organics collection program? She couldn't get an answer and that uh, then she created a steering group at the um, Center for Architecture, and that led to the Zero Waste Design Guidelines, um, produced by the Center for Architecture with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation. Closed Loops co-authored the guidelines with Claire Mifflin as the lead and Chris Grace of Foodprint Group. Chris is a food and retail um, waste expert and the CEO of uh, Footprint group, if I didn't mention that. So um, the first step, again, is to make the issue visible to designers, uh, the issue of zero waste. What does that mean? Um, we produced, this is a Sankey diagram to illustrate the linear cradle to grave system of material flow that we have in New York City. And sadly, it's typical. I mean, um, the diagram shows the 12,500 tons of waste per day that the sanitation department collects. Um, and then we only are showing those tons because the data is better uh, than the private side. Um, what you see on the left is what is, what is in your trash cans and in your, what you're generating from all the products you consume. And what you see on the right is where it goes only about half of the traditional recycling streams, metal, glass, plastic, and paper, are recycled. Um, and uh, the biggest, I think, 
impact of seeing this image is that orange, which is the organic waste. Um, organics uh, make up a third of the waste stream, and the vast majority of that is um, sent to landfills where it emits methane, which is a, a potent greenhouse gas, 30 times more potent than CO2. So it's very important to find a way to uh, capture that organic material. And once you capture it, it's actually, as we mentioned with the High Line, it's actually something that you can manage locally. Uh, and it's much easier to manage, it doesn't require manufacturing and all of the um, all of the things that are involved in, say, recycling plastics or, or metals. And as we mentioned, the, um, the New York City uh, had announced this goal of zero waste by 2030. What they, what they actually meant was a 90% reduction in waste. And we visualized what that would actually mean and found that it would require an 80% reduction in trash and a 50% reduction in the recyclables that we generate. So that means like what literally what you have in your garbage can would have to be reduced by a huge amount. And then of that material, 90% um, of it would have to go um, to recycling and not to, to landfill, including organics. Uh, so it's a very difficult challenge. And the guidelines process was based, uh, was collaborative and based on workshops and site visits with over 100 inter interdisciplinary stakeholders from architects and planners to property managers and union representatives, private waste haulers and city agencies, uh, building superintendents. Um, we visited over 40 buildings and followed the path of waste uh, from the act of discarding uh, to set out in various building types. Um, and again, back to this visualization issue, you can't uh, design for waste in a new building or manage it if you don't know what you have. So um, the zero waste design guidelines, which you can access online, zerowastedesign.org, um, includes an interactive waste calculator um, that shows you uh, what you need to plan for based on the building occupancy and suggests strategies you can use to reduce and divert more of the waste. Um, we also um, created um, typologies for buildings so that designers and property managers could have a better idea of what they're dealing with and figure out what strategies were appropriate for them. Here are typologies for residential buildings um, and then um, planning principles for commercial buildings as well. Um, and then importantly, we um, put forward best practice strategies. There are four of them. Um, planning for waste as a material flow, which is what Ben and I have been doing at the urban scale uh, with the pneumatic tubes and other projects. Um, but then also waste diversion strategies to make it easier to separate waste, waste reduction strategies to get to that, you know, figure out how you can actually generate less of that material that has to be discarded. And then strategies to um, actually reduce the volume and make it more efficient uh, you know, with compaction and other, other ways of reducing the amount that has to be uh, moved through the city and stored. Um, ben and I led the sections on planning uh, at the urban context. Um, and it was exciting to take a step back and look at ways to really incorporate waste reduction and diversion strategies. Uh, the guidelines have been uh, immensely successful. They're referenced in the AIA Top 10 Toolkit. They're on the DSNY, it's a sanitation department website. Um, the Enterprise Community Partners uh, guidelines also reference the guidelines, and uh, they should be in the next iteration of LEAD. So um, 
What we didn't quite realize when we started working on the guidelines is that the work would really begin after the guidelines were published. Um, so we formed last year the Center for Zero Waste Design with the goal of taking the guidelines to other cities and importing the lessons learned back to New York City, filling in the gaps and extending the content. Uh, this effort is led by the uh, authors of the guidelines, um, Claire Mifflin and also uh, Chris Grace and Ben and I. Um, and I love this image because designers often focus on the object, but I think uh, the solution really isn't in the object. Um, the trash cans here are beautiful, but they don't acknowledge the complexity of the waste stream, right? Uh, so this example of a solution illustrates how important it is to think at a system scale, even when you're working at the scale of a single building or a set of trash cans. So in this case, um, by thinking about the waste stream and how you could engineer what is getting thrown out, you're actually making it much easier, right? So here, um, if you control the products that the business is using, um, either recyclable, making everything either recyclable or um, reusable, it's much easier than to manage uh, the discards. But this requires another kind of space planning. Uh, you need to have space and logistics for washing and for distributing those reusable containers and also for collecting and processing organics. Um, these are things that need space, they need business models, and they need advocacy. Um, in the era of COVID, the sanitation department, for example, um, stopped collecting organics um, because it was too expensive and it wasn't and the way that they were doing it, door-to-door uh, -to -door collection with uh, small bins uh, really was expensive and was not working very well. Um, but um, there are a number of groups organizing now to try to take advantage of this moment to think differently about how we can achieve this goal. And, I don't really have time to go into it now, but there are a number of really interesting community-based initiatives with um, uh, community composting and in, in um, underserved communities. And I think a lot of these efforts feed into the system that you see here and the potential. So I really want to emphasize how important it is to design the system and not necessarily just the object. So uh, in 2019, uh, the New York City Housing Authority released a, a um, waste management plan. After years of disinvestment and understaffing uh, HUD, which is the um, Housing and Urban Development um, Agency, the federal level, which funds public housing, including NYCHA, required NYCHA to meet certain minimum requirements um, for quality of life. Things had gotten so bad that, that, that HUD said basically, uh, you know, these you know, improvements have to be made in a number of areas, um, including waste and pests. Um, and NYCHA has outlined of half a billion dollars of capital improvements that will be necessary to meet the waste infrastructure needs, mostly interior and exterior co trash compactors, but also um, an initiative to pilot pneumatic, a pneumatic collection system and uh, other strategies to improve quality of life and create real culture change around waste management. I was incredibly impressed by the ambitious goals of the plan. I, it's um, published online. I invite you all to look at it. Um, and I was also intrigued by the idea of shifting from research and advocacy and waiting, right? Waiting for politicians to the implementation of the very strategies that I have spent so much time exploring. 
I was hired by NYCHA's Director of Energy and Sustainability Programs to lead the pneumatic collection pilot, which is on track to be the first system built in the city and possibly in the US since Roosevelt Island. NYCHA buildings were not built to accommodate waste movement or recycling, and as a result, staff spend over half their time managing waste, while years of disinvestment and failing infrastructure have made the job even more difficult. Staffing levels for groundskeepers are much lower than they used to be. Um, this, these pages are from the Connected Community Guidelines, which is another NYCHA publication that was just released this year uh, for um, urban design and resident engagement. And it's a great publication. I encourage you to look at that also. And one of uh, the anecdotes in this um, in this Connected Communities Guide is that ground caretaker staff that manage the grounds um, used to be responsible 30 years ago for about a half an acre per person, per staff person, and now it's two acres per staff person. And the um, intensity of the waste volumes and the all of the constraints of um, public housing just make the job incredibly difficult. Um, a pneumatic system has the potential to reduce the health and safety burdens on caretaker staff, and many of them are themselves residents of NYCHA housing. So by improving waste management at NYCHA, not only are you improving quality of life for residents, but also, um, and staff, but also for residents. The scale of NYCHA is staggering uh, also. It's often the case with New York City. Um, there are almost 500,000 people living in NYCHA housing. Um, and that means that the challenges are huge, but the potential benefits are as well. The volume of waste at NYCHA is so big that improving NYCHA's very low recycling rate will actually raise the rate citywide. Um, there are a number of other initiatives that are being implemented at NYCHA from mattress recycling and cardboard balers that are new in New York City that are not, have not been done uh, or very little. Uh, so the scale of NYCHA means that these initiatives will have the potential to create new markets in New York City and impact waste management in neighborhoods across the city. Um, this diagram from the waste management plan shows the many steps that are required uh, by, by caretaker staff to manage waste. We're now working on a NYCHA waste calculator to help quantify the waste volumes and anticipate infrastructure needs and staffing, as well as so that as landfill bound trash goes down and recycling rates rise, we're, we make sure that the infrastructure is appropriate for that um, because you know, otherwise, if you're not thinking about those things, you will just build more of the same trash infrastructure and you're stuck, right? It's very difficult to, to get the behavior change without the infrastructure um, and the staffing procedures. And this is a spread from a recently, uh, wait, sorry, uh, this is also from, sorry, from uh, the Connected Communities Guide. And the reason I wanted to show this slide um, is that the waste yards, which is where all of the trash from NYCHA buildings is consolidated, um, are typically in the center of the campus. And they're often right on the street and they become a symbol of the community and their uh, often very negative impacts associated with them. Um, and so we are right now looking at ways to improve this infrastructure. And one of my goals is to really see how we can make it more of an amenity. Um, so there are real challenges uh, in three directions. And you know, it's the culture, the behavior change, the staff procedure, and the infrastructure. And how do you do this in a highly politicized environment where trust has to be regained? Um, so with that, uh, I thought we could ha open for questions and conversation.
I'll unshare my screen here. Hello. Um, my name is Zara. Uh, I'm a member of the DEI committee. Um, I'm a representative for the third years along with Valeria, Panita, and Claire. Um, we've been working with Professor Ibasol and Sanin to organize this event, and we're very grateful that Julia can come and speak today. Um, and we'd like to thank uh, the lectures committee, Professor Lori Brown and Professor Kyle Mil Miller for making this possible. Um, we are going to move into questions. So if you can use the raise hand feature, um, I will call on you when I see your name and you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, okay, so Lori Brown is <laughs> raising her hand. Well, I'll start since there was a little bit of a of a gap. Um, get to help people formulate questions. I want to thank you so much. It's been fascinating to see where you've come from in 2012 to now, and the evolution of all of your efforts and research and. One thing I'd like for you to talk about a little bit is, you know, you, you mentioned the shift from research and advocacy to implementation. And I, I would imagine just hearing you present this, that there were a lot of um, turns and curves that were unanticipated um, from where you started with Fast Trash. And as students who are interested in broadening the way to practice and think about operating as architects in the built environment. I think your work is so important in showing how this can be done. And I, can you speak a little bit to how, like you, you're up against so many challenges and the ways that what you thought you would do maybe didn't happen in the exact way you had hoped it would, but it offered other avenues of possibility. So could you speak to that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, I think, um, you know, it's interesting that, um, the focus of the symposium where we met, the, uh, Beyond Petrovich, was really uh, geared to that question of how do architects create their own clients and how do you um, uh, uh, sort of expand the scope of, of what it means to design. And I think, um, I guess I would say that um, I've been impressed, I think it's really about asking questions, you know, it's interesting now that I'm, I have been working within a, a larger institution and realizing that in some ways the same um, uh, skills and perspective are there, right? So they're not the same skills, but I guess to give an example, um, you know, you, have, you still have to convince, there's still lots of politics within an institution. And so in a sense, um, you still have to visualize and, and make the arguments for things. Um, but I think as architects um, in this, especially in the COVID era where everything is upside down, uh, I would really advocate for, um, you know, that you can do things by yourselves, you know, and, and I think, you know, starting with, um, you know, if you find something that doesn't work well, I think in my case, you know, I was really struck by the, you know, the trash on the streets, right? And and the more that I learned about it, obviously the more complex and the more, you know, it's a very, very large system and it's very humbling to try to work in that system. On the other hand, um, you know, there are small, like little inroads that you make. And I think, you know, we are hearing from developers who are using the waste calculator to think about their waste. Or even at NYCHA, we were able to show that, you know, maybe some developments didn't need four trash compactors because they weren't actually filling them all. And so maybe we could trans, we could um, convert one without paying any money, spending any money, just painting it. Uh, we could convert it to cardboard and pilot that 
with the pneumatic, I mean, sorry, with the sanitation department. And they're thrilled and we're thrilled because suddenly we can actually count how much cardboard these developments are generating. And so that didn't require any money. It just required sort of thinking about, well, what is this? What's going on here? And how could we do something different? Um, so I guess, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think in this moment where there's very, you know, maybe aren't the same opportunities, um, it, I think you do have the opportunity to sort of investigate and propose different ways of doing things and your skills in visualization are very powerful and you should not hesitate to use them. <laughs> So, um, if I had known there would be no questions, I would have shown more slides. <laughs> I, I, uh, there's so much more. I really encourage you to look at the Center for Zero Waste Design website because um, there are some other examples of the work that we've been doing. Um, and um, um, I see Valeria. Okay. It's still a little quiet. Maybe you could go in the chat. Or Uh, maybe if you write it in the chat, I see there's a question. Um, um, there's a, maybe I'll answer this question while well, Valeria, then if you want to write it, yours in the chat. This is from David, who asked, um, what does an amenity uh, look like? Um, that's a good question, and I'm I'm kind of such a trash nerd that I sometimes forget that <laughs> not everybody might think of trash as an amenity. But um, uh, and I think it's really about uh, removing the ick factor. So, and the you know when you have undifferentiated waste, um, it's gross, and it's um, and if but if you start sorting the material, then uh, you're just, you know, it's almost like a grocery store and shelves in reverse, right? It's just like you organize the material and things have their place. And um, it's not so gross anymore. And especially if you start um, uh, collecting things like compost, and if you do it in the right way, uh, to give you an example, uh, there's a park in Brooklyn, now that we don't have organics collection, uh, the Domino Park on the Brooklyn waterfront, which is um, a privately funded park, has uh, put forward an organics collection station where they have a, an in-vessel compost inside of a shipping container and you can come and drop off your compost. It's very clean, very cool, and that's a real amenity because it means that the residents who live around there can bring their organics and have a place, have a way to separate their organics and a place to take it. So um, I think that's an example. Another example is, you know, creating uh, maker spaces where you, you know, can repair things that's, you know, that otherwise would be trash or um, basically helping keep the material moving and getting where it needs to go <laughs> instead of backing up and making a mess. Um, so I'm not sure if that, David, if that really answered your question, but I think it's really about the system and, um, and, it, and also making it legible and easy to use. Um, Okay, Valeria put her question okay. in the chat. Yeah, so let's see. Um, for a student interested in following up with a topic, 
uh, and to begin to explore it with their personal and professional research, where would be a good place to start? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the Zero Waste Design Guidelines, which are online, is a great uh, resource. Um, and there are a lot of references in there as well. Um, so that's a great place to start. Um, if you are, um, I'm trying to think, I think another, what other areas? Um, I think another place to start is just to think about materials and waste when you're looking at your projects. So your other design projects. You know, if you're doing an urban design, don't just look at the circulation of pedestrians or, you know, the movement of, um, you know, deliveries in and how you're going to manage that or in a building. But think about, um, think about this waste stuff and that will lead you to some interesting, um, interesting uh, programming. You know, there's a really great, there's a very interesting example from France um, of uh, some designers who've come up with different um, sort of urban scale, very micro interventions. And they have one concept, which they, I don't think they've really built, but which I just love um, conceptually. And that is that they realize that the markets, um, you know, the food markets, the farmers markets, you know, there's a lot of food waste that's generated at the end of the day. And sure, you can take that to compost. But they thought, well, what if we co-locate a jam factory, <laughs> like a little jam, like uh, create a kind of um, a micro or, um, commercial kitchen where we can take all this produce and create preserves right there. And I think that's the kind of thinking, you know, so then you're not just thinking about, okay, I have this much waste and how do I manage it? But what are the materials that we're dealing with in, in, your, in this particular project? Or, and how, could, how can you uh, capture their, their value? And, um, and then that starts to have real benefits, right? Because you're creating employment and you're creating um, an identity for a place and you're creating an activity and pride and um, dignity. So I think um, we all create waste, but um, designers have this opportunity to um, to sort of to, to transform it. Um, um, Alexander M. I, I was curious about the pneumatic system just from an engineering standpoint um, I might have missed a bit of explanation because I had to talk to my professor but um, could you explain a little, a little bit of how sure, that works? Sure and you didn't miss I apologize I, I, uh, I went a little bit quickly with the pneumatics uh, but basically it's a very simple uh, it's fairly simple it's essentially uh, using a powerful vacuum or pressure to um, pull or you know, to create pressure inside of a tube that's 20 inches in interior diameter or less, typically. Um, and the way that it works is that um, uh, res users, residents, for example, will put their waste into uh, like a chute door, right? It can be in a building in a chute or it could be on the sidewalk, uh, it's just common in Europe. And then there's a reservoir underneath and the material sits in that reservoir and then there's a valve and uh, that's gravity that piece and then periodically the pneumatic system turns on and the valves are opened one by one and the material empties into this airstream and the material is, is sent to a central facility up to it could be up to two miles away even i mean it's rare mile you know, roosevelt island is a little over a mile um, and then it's compacted into a container like um, you know shipping container like uh, the kind of trash compactors that you see in loading docks um, and then there are diverter valves that allow you to uh, collect different streams at different times so you can have an input for recycling and an input for trash and those valves are opened at different times. Um, so it's a way of consolidating material 
and avoiding all of these touch points along the way uh, that otherwise uh, you have to you have to deal with, right? Um, uh, Professor really cool. Thank you. Hello, oh, Juliet. Thank you so much. It was super um, inspiring and very urgent. Um, my question is about the separation of city from the rural areas. The map that you showed um, of the lines uh, taking the trash from Manhattan to, to walk away, maybe, toward the, mm. the rural side. Um, that is very telling because what you're talking about is essentially a city problem, um, how to deal with all this trash and the rural areas perhaps are not as um, uh, concerned with that. But then the consumables are imported from the rural areas and then the trash is exported out to the rural areas. And that is happening globally as well. So is it your stance that everything should be done locally? Um, the, so in Tokyo, after the war, they used to take out the feces out to the hinterland and use that as you know, compost and then grow vegetables and they bring in the vegetables. So that cycle was yeah. out of making sense, but not really anymore, perhaps not back then either. So what is your um, understanding um, of that separation? Yeah. Well, it's actually really interesting um, that you make that point. Um, so I have... Uh, you know, recently I've been very focused on um, public housing and this implementation. <laughs> it's kind of taken a lot of my uh, attention, but uh, my but the Center for Zero Waste Design um, has put forward, and I think this is, I'm describing this to illustrate kind of your point, um, in the wake of the city's um, abandoning organics collection, right? So the organics collection in New York City most of it goes uh, to, uh, so there's a pre-processing plant in Brooklyn uh, that takes some material, but other material goes to farms, to composting sites, um, and some goes to Staten Island. It's actually, uh, city food waste is very high in nitrogen and, and um, it's, it's very smelly, you know, so it doesn't, it's a little hard to deal with, so anaerobic digestion is, is very good for that. And so there are new anaerobic digestion plants that are being built. Um, but in the wake of the city deciding to stop collection, uh, a group of us with the Center for Zero Waste Design uh, put together a proposal, which we're still working on, um, to take a much broader approach, uh, really look at the whole cycle from, uh, and, and including the hinterland of New York City, and look at how the, the food waste um, and organics uh, loops could be managed more efficiently and, and to really make sure that the food, that the waste from New York City is nourishing the soil. Um, and um, we are, referencing work in Paris that's very interesting because in Paris, uh, so our pro the approach in New York City is very logistics based. The sanitation department sends trucks around and then we try to figure out how we could deal with, you know, how we can accommodate these trucks and how we can accommodate, um, you know, the streets that we have. And in Paris, they took the opposite approach for organics and they looked at the um, geography. You know, where is the green space in the city? What, how much food waste is being generated? And they did a spatial analysis of this. So this is, a, I could actually send a link to the, um, to the organizers to the French report. It's very interesting. But they, um, then they looked at how much compost the city could support and also, um, and so we were, um, using that as a model to look at how New York City could take a sort of systems approach to the organics and um, in relationship to the hinterland. So I don't think it's a city problem, it's a regional problem. I also don't think that the city, it's, that you can 
limit the borders to the city that that's very i mean i know that in a way conceptually there's something very nice about imagining you know 100 percent urban farming and 100 percent um you know net zero energy and all of these things but the reality is that there are efficiencies you know some things require more space and are better suited to other places um so that's kind of a uh, a long-winded way of saying that um, I don't think it's just a city issue. New York, I mean, it is interesting to point out that cardboard and paper, for example, is mostly processed locally in New York City, which is there, or in the region, there's a big paper mill, the Pratt paper mill and the pizza boxes really are, um, produced locally from paper that's recycled. So there are some examples of that. Um, Thank you. Um, I mentioned uh, that if anybody is interested in this topic and wants to discuss further or has questions for their projects, I'm always happy to um, be a resource. So please don't, don't hesitate. Um, I can at least direct you towards some of these other resources uh, if you have other questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Fascinating. Really appreciate it. I want to thank you and I also wanted to thank the students for doing a great job and organizing and they chose you independent of our advice <laughs> and they had complete freedom and I think they made a great choice and, and, and did a great job doing that. It's a really important topic uh, and I really appreciate I also want to uh, thank all those that were involved in making this possible. But I didn't mean to cut it off, I just wanted to thank you for I wanted to ask you a question because um, one of the things in, in, in South Korea, one of the things that uh, has been, been doing for a long time is precisely this idea of organic recycling. I live there and on every Sunday you'd have to go out and go into this very cookie place and cook everything you haven't eaten. But they have come up with this idea that, which I think is really interesting, I want, I want to get your feedback, that actually they track the amount of garbage you produce and your tax according to the amount of trash you produce. Yeah. So the more trust you produce, the more tax you have to pay. And I, I, I always find that as a sort of fascinating. Yeah. Uh, that, that is actually um, incredibly important. Uh, it's, a, there's a, it's a policy instrument that's called um, in this country, pay as you throw or save as you throw. Um, and it's very controversial, though, because there is the sense that, um, uh, you know, people will if they're charged, they will then litter, right? Or illegal dumping, or that it's unfair, or you know, uncertain. But the truth is that um, uh, there's been research to show that it automatically reduces waste generation by like 13% or something. And it's common in um, suburban areas in the US uh, by volume. So you'll have a certain, you pay for a certain size cart uh, you know, and that's how you you have a subscription. And if you choose a smaller cart, you pay a smaller amount. In uh, in Switzerland, they have a bag. Where you put, you pay, you buy um, a sticker or a special bag. Um, it's actually very challenging to do that in multifamily uh, buildings um, when you have um, when it's at the building scale. So I think what you're describing in Korea would be. Uh, at like um, at a neighborhood scale that you walk to a public location, is that right? That's um, sh like it's not an individual building, that kiosk is in the public realm? Actually, no, actually it's a complex of building like we live oh. on 20 feet floor. Oh, okay. On the first month we were there, we had this knock on the door Sunday at 6 o'clock in the morning. And they told us, time to get down to do the recycling as a community. So the whole building every week, every week, the different floor was in charge of organizing and, oh. and reorganizing oh. it. So, you know, it would be like basically every month because it was like a 30 story building. Wow. So you Actually, get, that's very yeah. interesting. So that was um, the, the residents were, were uh, had the responsibility yeah. to manage. That's really interesting. I don't know who came with the idea of Sunday at six in the morning, but yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I think, uh, but just to come back to the design and why the, the zero waste design guidelines are really sort of geared to addressing this issue of how, how do you implement these common sense policies in a very dense environment where, um, and there are, but there are uh, examples where that's being done. Um, but it's tricky, like, you know, with a trash chute or a shared container, it's very anonymous whose material is whose. And um, but uh, Korea, there's some, there's also a food waste, I believe, right? There's a very lot of uh, food waste and uh, capture. Um, there are lots of very interesting examples out there. And, and um, I think, I don't know, I, I really think that the more that architects and planners and designers think about waste, the more, um, it's a very humbling thing, but it also, I think it improves design in general because um, uh, it's, um, you're, because it's sort of something that touches everybody. It's like, I, I think of it as like a kitchen, you know? Like it used to be that a kitchen was a service space and now we're very used to the idea that a kitchen is a place that's open in, a, in an apartment and that it's like a public space. And I often wonder what it would be like if our waste areas had that same, you know, if we treated them the same way. Um, so one more question, if I may. Uh, so one of the things that always is a bit of a challenge uh, is the kind of informal economy that goes around some of the recycling, right? That in many ways is livelihood for a lot of people. I think here in Syracuse, yeah. you know, have people that come up to three o'clock in the morning looking for bottles to exchange, you know, or you know, in all kind of different ways of the process. Uh, something like the pneumatic to do you think it can incorporate it in some part of the process or, or would it replace or how, how do you see the kind of social yeah. impact at that level? I mean, I do think that a lot of these strategies to um, organize waste uh, do not are not necessarily um, conducive to the informal processes, which often involve scavenging and um, it's difficult. It's, um, there's a group, there's a movement in New York City with the canners and there's a film, Yes We Can, I think about the, um, and I guess I would argue for other types of, of um, community uh, engagement around waste that are sort of more productive. The, the scavenging is really based on the bottle bills <laughs> Right, and the, so if they took away that the the deposit, suddenly that you know people wouldn't be scavenging anymore. But I think if there was a way to, um, for example, you know the reuse of furniture and repair, and the, as we mentioned, the food waste, like there are all of these things that are um, very that are difficult to manage in large scale centralized. Um, systems and that are conducive to smaller uh, operations. I didn't show examples of this, but there are a number of community-based organizations with bicycle collection of organics that, you know, to community gardens. And um, there's one called BK Rot in Brooklyn. Um, there are, uh, you know, uh, there's a very interesting group called Fab Scrap that takes uh, textile uh, scraps and volunteers and, um, uh, sort them. And then they actually have a boutique in, in the garment district where you can buy fabric that was cast off. And um, so I think, you know, there are a lot of, um, and then this another industry that I think is, you know, I really hope we see more of is washing. So of, of distributing containers and washing them. And there's a, a group in, there are a few groups around the country that have been looking at um, even larger chains, um, distributing bowls, for example, that are reusable. And so you're not, 
um, instead of having all this trash that nobody wants, that nobody even scavengers don't want because there's no deposit, you take that material and then you use a restaurant kitchen when it's not in use to wash those uh, containers and put them back in circulation. And so um, I think creating um, jobs in, in those areas um, that are in a way more in line with you know their higher value than just um, you know digging around in, in the trash. On the other hand, it's difficult because there's a whole culture around scavenging and a freedom and kind of independence around scavenging. So um, I think it's something that has to be, you know, uh, probably uh, the thing to do is really to um, create more opportunities for engagement, you know, and sharing. Actually, there's an interesting project that one of your faculty, Julie Moskowitz Torres, has been involved with the um, food carts, uh, uh, the association, the trade association for uh, food vendors in New York City, and and helping them think about advocating for them and design solutions that make their lives easier, you know, because they're out in the elements uh, with their food carts and often women. And so we've had some conversations about how you could incorporate some of these waste principles to maybe into their um, business. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities. And, um, yeah. Hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you, Juliet, for the presentation. Um, it was, um, I think, really um, great for the students to hear that. Um, I think it was, it's so important to um, address the issue of waste management and trash as a systems issue. Um, and, and part of that work is, you say, making, making the system visible. Um, but I think also there's a cultural challenge, um, especially in the United States when it comes to waste management and when we um, kind of compare ourselves to our European counterparts, I feel like there's such a gap between um, kind of the collective unconscious and our attitudes towards the abject and versus um, how we see waste as something of value. And I'm curious um, to hear from you in your work with neighborhoods, how, how you kind of approach that topic of uh, maybe removing that association with the abject to something that is valuable um, and to kind of gain um, buy-in from, from them as stakeholders into these systems. Yeah. I think it's, it is very difficult. Um, I think that waste is a, it's a politically um, dangerous topic. So, um, you know, I think partly, and I think, in the, I think you're right that uh, we have a different culture here. And part of it is actually that we don't have the kind of uh, policies in place, like landfill bans and um, EU, for example, or Korea, other, even in African countries that I don't know over the last few years have had very strict zero waste uh, requirements, uh, which is sort of interesting of just saying we can't deal with, we don't, we can't build the infrastructure to manage plastics. So let's just get rid of them altogether. And, deal with the inconvenience um, because the benefits are, are so much bigger. Um, but here, trash is always the cheapest, just, you know, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, so I think the way to deal with, I think the way to deal with it is um, kind of, well, I, should, I would say one of the resources is really talking to the people who manage it all the time. And so in the guidelines, you know, like I mentioned, we had superintendents and other people, and some of the really interesting ideas were coming from the people who are just confronted by that material day in, day out. Um, and there's some really creative solutions. Like one example from Stuyvesant Town 
is uh, you know so they're you know they're high-rise buildings and um, they don't have they're older buildings so they don't have like the waste recycling on each floor they have it at the base level and then they have a trash chute and somebody had the idea that maybe if you could create instead of having a garbage can for paper and cardboard which cardboard never fits in <laughs> you could create like almost like a countertop like the post office with slots and a little like box cutter so you come with your box and then you you break it down and it goes in the slot and suddenly it's just not a big deal and that you know those are ideas that just come from people being stuck with a you know huge mountain of cardboard and what do we do you know so i think that's a good place to start and then in, with, we've also really tried to show examples as much as possible. There's one other uh, case study that's really, I think, really exciting, um, well, two actually. And it's been interesting because New York City is so big and you think like, why would you look at what a small city is doing, you know? Uh, but one example that I think is very inspiring is um, in uh, Roanoke, Virginia. So, the community where um, a small city where there was an increase in, you know, an urban interest in like outdoor dining and interest in kind of the downtown, it's very small. And they had all these garbage carts, so not garbage bags, but carts piling up everywhere. And it was impacting the restaurant's ability to have their outdoor dining. And somebody said, well, wait, maybe we could use a parking space or a section of this parking lot and create a, put a compactor in that this neighborhood could use and so almost like the pneumatic system but manual right you bring you know everybody brings their stuff and it could be available 24 7 and it took i asked them well how did you do this because how you know how did you basically cut off the garbage collection and go to this manual the system where you have to walk three blocks and they said well it took many many sessions with the business improvement district and and finally somebody put came forward and said well let's just try it and so they tried it and then it was um people really loved it so then they divided the downtown into these zones and each zone got their central location and they also have recycling there and it's been so popular that now other neighborhoods are want asking for it <laughs> so i think it's like how do you get that first one, you know, and, you know, there are lots of examples like that. And, and I'm actually um, encountering this with at NYCHA where we're thinking about where we can put infrastructure for residents to put things. And, you know, the impulse is, well, it has to be as close as possible to the entrance. But I actually think that if you can, can you can rationally, do, you know, space these things that makes it easier to maintain and then they can be a better amenity right so we're going to test out some of this and see because it, it's hard to know in advance so i think to answer your question it's really um you know looking talking to the people that are dealing with it all the time and spending time with them on the one hand and then also getting lucky i guess you know a lot of it is getting lucky these you know somebody has takes the initiative and has enough authority within their sphere to do to try the thing and i think that's one of the real problems in new york city is it's just so big that uh it requires too much sign off from too many different entities and so you know you can't just you don't have like the public works person who's also the trash, who's also the, you know, I don't know. So I think looking at these smaller cities is a way of, um, you know, moving the needle. Um, if, I, if I may also ask a question. Hi, it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you. I can probably cite the Zero Waste uh, Handbook by heart, so the big fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I love that you introduced the idea of flag in this work. I've also kind of had the luck to do with the sanitation department. Uh, I think the problem of infrastructure at a larger real estate scale really comes up. Like the question of time and kind of pushback of, uh, so that you have to intervene at a very specific moment in time. There are perfectly fine goods that someone will eventually want, but no one has anywhere to put them. Yes. Yeah. 
it's just like an incredible question to think about in the context of an architecture school where you know problems may seemingly be solved as simply as oh yeah and here is a massive storage facility but you know this is not how the world works yeah. and intervening requires this close reading I, yeah. No, I think it's true, and I think I actually think that looking at the city, looking, and this is why the example from France is very interesting, where they looked, they took a, a land use based approach to planning for waste, as opposed, like I said, to the logistics model that the New York has taken, um, because you can start to see where there might be, um, you know, potential, right, and and. Um, Again, I, I, I think um, there's a, the question of land use is really difficult because um, we have to change, sometimes we have to actually try to change the zoning. The zoning doesn't allow the kind of consolidation that I was just describing in New York City, you're not actually allowed the NYCHA um, waste yards are, are um, sort of grandfathered in <laughs> because they're on multiple parcels, so those uh, develop the campuses, and so under the current um, zoning, uh, this is not considered an accessory use, it's considered like a waste facility when really it's an amenity, right, for the neighborhood and it's helping the neighborhood function. Uh, so uh, there, we do need to make some changes on the, on the policy side, and also, like you say, on the one hand, we need to think about the way the logistics, but we can't also let the logistics be too put too much pressure. Like, for example, the sanitation department has also said that they want a 40 foot setback so that if you're going to provide a container in New York City, you have to provide essentially like a, you know, this space that's just um, impossible unless it's in a parking lot, right? To provide off essentially off street loading for the whole garbage truck. Otherwise, you have to put the bags on the curb. Those are the two options you have, and it's just like that's not that's not really realistic. So um, there is like a lot of work to be done. Try to you know get get to a, a middle a middle ground. I think there is one more question in the chat from Kelsey Manon. Um, okay, uh, yeah. Um, I have a question about the systems which main, maintain zero waste. Is wastewater a consideration using systems which utilize gray water, storm water? Um, are there more effective ways to utilize water in urban designs which do not have room for uh, larger um, waste management? Plants. Um, I mean, I haven't. We haven't really talked about um, uh, wastewater because that's there's so much work on wastewater already, and um, there's some really interesting thinking about passive solutions, right? And all of the excuse me, green infrastructure, um, but. Uh, the organics treatment in New York City, for example, piggybacks on the wastewater treatment plants. So the, the, a lot of the organics are going into this. So anaerobic digestion is also used in sewage treatment plants. And the, there's one in New York City now that's uh, where the methane is being um, converted into electricity. And so they've uh, adapted the New Town Creek wastewater facility to accept food waste from uh, that's been it's basically ground up and then it's added um, but I think to your question uh, wastewater is you know very important and 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 there are and I think the same types of the same type of systems thinking is can be applied um, and I'm sort of interested, we looked at a project, sort of a conceptual project that included, um, you know, one of these washing facilities that I talked about it, just this idea of, of washing reusable containers. And so we, we didn't get very far with it, but another question is what do you do with the wastewater there? So are there, um, 
if, you know, good ways of, of managing the water. I guess the other adjacent or the other parallel I would say is, you know, just the scales of infrastructure and how, you know, you can, I think looking at a district scale is really, um, really interesting. Um, we know we need a lot, we need solutions at every scale. Like we're not gonna just, to the point earlier about do we, where are the borders of in our intervention? Like, are you just looking at the city? Are you looking at the hinterland? I think we have to look at every scale. And so the neighborhood scale, the building scale, and doing that with wastewater, I think is, um, would be a rich area to look at. So, um, Anything, anything else? That, as you can tell, I could talk about this all day. So, thank you so much for, um, you know, for this conversation. And um, thank you, thank you very much. This was yeah, great. thank you so much. It was fantastic. And again, okay. thanks to all the students. Um, this has been recorded. So it will be available on the World Wide Web. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And um, uh, again, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.